and speak. Okay. Speak your so, mind. So we are on page 14, and we're working our way through this, this Torah portion, which talks about the service in the tabernacle. Remember, the Jews built a tabernacle, which is a, a temporary, mobile, collapsible sanctuary, a place of holiness, where a place where someone walked in. There was a, a palpable sense of God and a palpable sense of connection. And there was a, it was a place of function, but the primary function was bringing offerings to God. And the, the offerings to God was really bringing offering of, offerings of ourselves but through the mechanism of an offering. A physical offering and uh, a, a time to draw close to God. And again, the, the, the general term for an offering is in the Hebrew is karban, which means uh, in, in its uh, grammatically, etymologically, is coming close. So we had spoken about different animal offerings. Then we went to, we, the, the Torah made it clear that there's, you know, that not everybody's going to be able to offer, bring an offering of. An expensive offerings, let's say a steer, so there's a, a, a sheep, and then we went into meal offerings, the grain, and um, baking loaves or matzahs. So we say, after break, baking the loaves, on page 14 at the top, this is where we're up to, sit, uh, verse 6, break each one into two pieces and each half in two, so the priest will later be able to easily remove the memorial portion. You must then pour the rest of the load of oil over the loaves, is a grain offering, and all grain offerings must have the remainder of their log of oil poured on them, except the two types baked in the oven as above. So we went through this, and I showed you last week some diagrams of how it worked, and also a, a, a scoopful of what it would be done. Um, we looked at what that, what that is, because that will be mentioned again. Number seven. If your grain sacrifice or offering is a grain offering, fried in the deep frying pan, because there are different types of grain offerings. And this one, we're talking about loaves, and here it's baked in, in a deep frying pan, or cooked in a deep frying pan. It must be made of one tenth of an eighth of fine white wheat flour mixed with a load of oil. Here, too, the flour is first placed in a vessel containing some of the required load of oil. So put the flour in. It's then mixed with more of this oil and kneaded into 10 loaves. But since in this case the frying pan is deep enough, enough oil will remain to soften the dough, so the resulting loaves will be elastic and will therefore quiver. After frying the, the and he brings that because Rashi brings it because it's alluded to in the verse. After frying the loaves, break each one in half and then each half into quarters, so the priest will later be easily be able to easily remove the memorial portion. After this, pour the rest of the log of oil over them. So we, we dealt with all the, the details, the memorial of that last week. Thus, you must bring, I, I want to go to nine and we'll talk a little bit. Thus, you must bring to God the grain offering that was made from any of these five preparations of flour. In each case, the offerer must bring it to the priest and the priest must bring it to the southwest corner of the altar. What was said above in nine regarding the unpaked grain offering applies to all these types of grain offerings. The priest must lift out the memorial fistful. Again, some of this memorial ideas that, so to speak, God is remembering. We're remembering God. We're, bringing a God, we're, we're getting into a conscious zone between us and God it's called memorial. And there's a fistful that comes out from the, the grain offering and burn it on the altar. Removing the memorial portion from the flour mixture of broken loaves must be performed with the intention that it be a fire offering. There has to be intent. There has to be consciousness. There has to be a sense of, of focus on what we're doing and, and that this is going to be destined to be consumed by fire and that we want to, to do what gives God nachas and would be pleasing to God. It is usually poor people who bring rain offerings for this is all they can afford. Nevertheless, because their personal offering and offering up their only food is greater than that of those who can afford to offer up more expensive sacrifices, you know, potentially, God is especially appreciative of their offering, considering it as if they had offered up their very selves. So there's, there, are, uh, there are a number of things here. One is, you know, and actually, I'm going to split screen. We'll talk about what we have here. Um, this is uh, this top here piece here is a translation. Ignore the bottom piece because maybe we'll deal with that later. Um, this is a, a, actually, I meant to write. What is this? Is from Maimonides. And Maimonides has a, his, his code of law. And in his code of law, he has actually really two books that deal with the 
the temple or the tabernacle and its service. And one of the things, this is a, a translation of the, one of his sections about what is brought, uh, things brought on the, on the, on the um, altar. And this is how he concludes that set of laws. So what he says, he, even though it's things brought on the altar and a lot of things brought on the altar, his final one talks about oil for meal offerings. Again, meal offerings are not the premium type of offering. This, there was a steer, or a cow, this, and uh, uh, a sheep, and this was for someone who couldn't afford the, the premium style. Since all of these categories of oil that he had spoken about before are acceptable for the meal offerings, why were they listed as separate categories? Okay, that's not a question that we're going to deal with right now. I want to get to, to his answer. Says that. Um, that the Torah wanted to, us to know the superior category that nothing surpasses. Those which are equal and those which are inferior. Wanted us to understand the scale. In this way, one who desires to gain merit for himself will subjugate his, and subjugate his evil inclination and amplify his generosity should bring a sacrifice from the most desirable and superior type of the item he's bringing. So at one level, on the one level of scale, because Torah is not simple, Torah life is not simple and it's not unidimensional, and we have sometimes competing values that we have to balance, right? Like we we're talking about before, about the, the responsibility to a community and, and the responsibility to, to, to save my own life. Those are both values, but they have to be balanced. Here, there's when it comes to giving of ourselves to the community, whether it's, it's charity, it's to your local library, or it's to the, the Samikdash, to, or to, to the, to the tab, tabernacle or temple. On the one hand, Torah says, be giving. And what the language he says, subjugate is evil inclination. Evil inclination he means the, 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 the self, the, 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 the self protection. If I have X amount of money, I want it. I want to hold on to it. Why shouldn't I? Why should I give it away? And if someone, if the community needs something, uh, so first of all, I may feel pressured to give something. I might feel, you know, almost like uh, manipulated into giving something. So I'm going to give the, the least amount possible. Um, or even if I, 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 something touches my heart, okay, but the thing is, I, obviously I have to protect myself. So again, if, even with Kanesha, I, I probably, I, uh, if I just did this right before the class, I would have changed the language. Evil with makes it sound like it's evil. Taking care of ourselves is not evil, but it is self-directed. And self-direction without opening ourselves up to others' needs is not holy. Let's call it that. It's, it's an unholy inclination to, to keep you know, all my, my nickels by me and not think that about sharing nickels according to what I can. So therefore, what Maimonides is saying is that the Torah gives us in the offerings a scale. And the scale is for us to know what we can shoot for because we want to do things right. We want to do things in a, in a respectful way. So you know, this is something that again, I just to talk about it because it's in our lives. You know, in in the old days when there was rummage sales, rummage sales were a good thing. First of all, we had them here a few times. We make a couple thousand dollars if Donna's on the phone, um, and we and it was it was a nice thing. It was also a way for people to get rid of things they 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 didn't need and could be useful to someone else because not wasting as a value. And one person's throwaway is another person's, uh, maybe not treasure, but usable thing. So that, and that is a value. That's, that's a good thing. Now on the giving end, let's say I'm, I'm going through my basement or my attic and I'm looking for what I can give to rummage sale. The reason that the things are on my basement or my attic are often because I have no use for them anymore. Now, not having use for them anymore could be because my kids outgrew them or because I wouldn't let them wear it even if it was, it, it didn't outgrow them. It's not good. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't look good or whatever. It, it's, it's not something that I would let, that I would want my family to wear. Those are two very different things. One is that it's in good shape. I just have no need for it anymore. One is that it's not in good shape, but someone else could use it. You know, they have lower standards. And that too is, is a value, a mitzvah that, that we now we're making use of it. 
But on the giving end, I shouldn't be the, the person who just like away gives the, it just gives away things that you know that I consider beneath my standards. Or it's it's really one it, it, for many people, and we we're actually now we're sending things to Ukraine. Um, and uh, one of the things, uh, or something, clothing, whatever, one of the things that uh, circulated from the Chabad Rabbis is try to make sure that it's, it's things that people would actually have their own family use. And that gives some dignity. We don't want to only give them throwaways. We don't want to give them something else. It's, too, it's, it's, it's not good enough for me, but <laughs> listen, you're, you're in a war zone. It's good. Use it and be, and be happy with it. By the way, that it's true. They will be happy with it. But for my own humanity, I shouldn't just be giving away things that are beneath me. I should be giving away things that I would use and I could use, whether it's money or anything else. But, uh, uh, but this is that I, I, I don't, it's I'm, I'm giving. That it's, it's not, it's, it's that I, I'm giving it myself and giving it myself means something that, it, it's something I could have used. I could, if it's money for sure, I could have used it to, to, to buy myself something pleasurable or whatever it is, or just make myself feel more secure with my 401k, whatever. But here I'm giving away of myself. And that's what my mind is saying, is that the, the Torah wants us to know the scale so that we can test our own generosity. And then he gives us a general rule beyond the, the Laws. Uh, he does that from time to time as, as he closes a, a section. He says the same applies to everything given for the sake of the Almighty, who is good. What, is, what do you mean the God is good? If God is good, we should be good. And what is good means we're good in, in giving go together. That we should be giving, we should be generous. It should be the most attractive and highest quality. Anything we do for God should be good. If one builds a house of prayer, it should be more attractive than his own dwelling. If he feeds a hungry person, he should feed from the best and most tasty foods of his table. If he clothes one who is naked, he should clothe him with his attractive garments. If he consecrates something, he should consecrate the best of his possessions. As the Torah says, it states, all the superior qualities should be given to God. Now, that does not mean, um, just to, this is a second, that does not mean that, you know, that literally we have to look and say, you know, well, my house is like this, and we have to make the show nicer. If I have a really nice house, it, 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 it's it won't have to measure. But the I think what, what, what Maimonides is saying is, if I live well, I shouldn't be okay with my community library being in a shack. Not that I have to build it all, but I should I should want to 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 step up to the plate so that it's a nice place, or my community hospital. Our community is a house of worship, whatever it may be. Donna, you ask something? No. Okay. Um, so the the it's it's something that we're when we're giving, we should give nice. Let it be nice, and we should want the 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 communal um, functions to be nice. And it says a, a lot about a community when not only do people live well, but the, their school is nice, and their, their, their house worship is nice, and their hospital is nice, and they, 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 it's, it's their, their communal needs. And that's what Maimonides is saying. Now, balanced with that, what's interesting is that he, Maimonides brings this, that, that whole piece, when he's talking about meal offerings, which was not the nicest. Meal offerings is the, the, the lowest uh, um, offering on the totem pole, lowest in the food chain. And that's where Maimonides, let's loose, we'll do, we, 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 we should be giving of the best of ourselves. And part of that is the idea that giving of the best of ourselves is sometimes it's, we have the capacity to do something physical, to be able to, to help physically. Sometimes we're actually giving of ourselves. And it, the, the, the dollar that the person is giving is not a, a tremendous, uh, it doesn't have tremendous buying power, but they're giving of themselves, extending themselves. And that's what's beautiful. And Maimonides, um, as the Rebbe pointed out, and, and that's where we're gonna read something now, I think he specifically placed this lesson, not when he was talking about bringing expensive offerings. 
he, he teaches the lesson when, when he's talking about bringing in expensive offerings, which would seem contradictory. But I think what, one way we can read that is that he's trying to say, it's not just about the dollar amount of what you're giving. And if the dollar amount of what you're giving is giving of yourself, we really, you're extending yourself to really, it's every, we, all, uh, we each have our own uh, comfort level. And our, our, our generosity is very, very individual, very, very subjective. That's a Torah idea. Just as needs are totally subjective. What people need, it's, 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 uh, we can't sit and assess, well, you know, this person, people only need this, only need that. You really have to talk to them to find out what they need. And what's considered generosity for one is not considered generosity for another. So even if someone is blessed with a lot of means, it's, the, the, it's, it's not a, a, so much about the number that they're giving, it's about whether they're giving of themselves. And certainly a person who does not have that capacity, if they're giving a smaller number, does not mean that they're not giving a beautiful uh, uh, contribution to the greater good, where that's, that's considered giving of themselves. So we we'll take a look at note nine in the Hasidic Insights. Considering it as if they had offered up their very selves. When we bring a beautiful animal as an offering to God, we are liable to take pride in our generosity and the fact that we fulfilled God's will. Although on the right side of the bottom of 14, in the best and most beautiful manner. In contrast, when all we can afford to bring to God is a meager grain offering, such feelings of pride are most likely absent. The sole reason we bring our sacrifice is to subjugate ourselves to more surrender. We're, do, we're doing what God wants. God wants it, fine. I don't feel proud about it. I don't understand it. I can't afford it. But I'm, 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 I'm doing what God said. That, that's, that's beautiful. It's that, that we're, we're putting ourselves aside and, just, and, and following God's guidance. It is therefore specifically the grain offering of a poor person that most eloquently expresses the essence of the sacrifices. Which the essence is the offering up of ourselves to God. And, and the Ahmadis are uh, the rabbis in the Middle Age, Ages uh, write this very explicitly when it comes to, to, to uh, uh, trying to understand the offerings to the extent we can, is that there's a certain, there's a, in, in, the, in the one offering, offering whatever it was, whether it was uh, uh, chalas or, or an animal, they really have to think about offering themselves in their minds to be offering themselves. When we truly negate our sense of self and undertake to serve God with simple and direct faith, rather than for any ulterior motives or personal ambitions, we are assured of acceptance and atonement. So the key, why does a person bring an offering? A person bring an offering because they're trying to, they're, they're, they're trying to plug into to a connection with God either because they, they, they feel they've been out of connection or something could happen and they want to be able to say thank you. There are different reasons a person will bring, you know, bring an offering. If it's about the relationship, then the more you make space for God, for the other, the more you're doing to strengthen the relationship. So therefore, we're saying is that this idea of pushing aside ulterior motives or personal ambitions in, it ensures us more of the success in trying to, either whether it's atonement or acceptance by God. The selflessness is embodied most in the approach of a poor man, which is why it is about him specifically that God says, I consider it, consider it as if he offered up his very self. And God says that I, when you bring these offerings, I will see it as though you brought the offering, you brought yourselves as an offering. Okay, um, go to, to verse 10 now. Similarly, the remainder of every grain offering is to be treated the same way as the remainder of unbaked grain offering. It will belong to the priests. First Aaron, or after him, whoever the then current high priest in any generation, will take whatever portion of it he chooses and then his sons or after them the officiating priests will take whatever is left, dividing it up among themselves. Nonetheless, their portion is still considered an offering of superior holiness. And therefore, 
they may only eat it from time from the point in time when the memorial service has been burned up on the altar as one of the fire offerings of God. If, however, the offerer is himself a priest, and then his great uh, then his grain offering must be burned up in its entirety, none of it may be eaten. Nonetheless, oil and frankincense, and we looked into the frankincense last week, must still be added to the flour. On the right side, like the middle, lower part of the middle of the page, is, is verse 11. No grain offering that you sacrifice to God may be made out of anything leavened. Okay, we're coming up to Pesach. Nothing leavened. There's, there's we call chametz is uh, leavening. Soer is the not, in other words used in Torah, uh, but it's more the the leavening agent. Not that cannot be used. For you must not, not burn up any leavening agents or any sweet fruits as a fire offering to God. So it's interesting. The word in Torah here is the what the the, the way I, I would imagine this has been translated for generations, including today, is that we, we cannot bring any leavening agents or honey on the on the. Uh, the altar. The, the word in the verse is dvash. Dvash means honey. Now, why did this uh, Chabadster translation call it sweet fruits? Because even though it says honey, when the Torah says honey, it may mean honey, but it often means uh, either date honey or any sweet fruit. So, for example, when when the Torah li lists off the the, we have like land flowing with milk and honey, right? Um, the the honey we're talking about the honey, uh, and we have seven um, species, which uh, the, it, Israel is blessed with, and and we look to them as special symbols of of the blessing of the land. Honey is mentioned there also. Honey is not, not uh, agricultural. Honey doesn't grow. But the as Rashi will say, actually Rashi says here and says uh, um, other times in the Torah when this idea of, of honey with regard to the land of Israel is, is, is uh, mentioned, it refers to, um, to date honey. In other words, that it was, it's uh, they take the flesh of the date and they, they treat it, and that's uh, they call that honey. Now, that in this case, Rashi says, since honey doesn't necessarily mean bee honey, this mean, goes for anything sweet. Any sweet, in this case, it would be fruits because we we're bringing those on the offering. There's no place for sugar on the, on the offering, but there was for, for agriculture. Sweet fruits, they are they fall under the rubric of honey, and they are not brought on, on, on the temple on the altar. Now, okay, that's that's the instructions. That's that's, that's what the boss says. So, what's the inside of that? What's an insight? So, first of all, let's talk. The leavening agent is a little easier for us to understand because when it comes to to Passover to Pesach, which we're coming up on. Pesach is considered, we're there it's matzah and no chametz, because Pesach is a freedom holiday, it's a growth holiday, and we talk about the idea of matzah, the difference between matzah in ingredients, between matzah and, and, uh, and uh, bread, is that one is allowed to rise, either with a leavening agent or even without a leavening agent, but it's allowed to rise. Matzah is not allowed to rise. So matzah symbolizes well, the bread would symbolize the rising, like the bloated ego. And matzah is, 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 symbolizes humility, and which is our humility would allow us to be honest with ourselves, to be able to, to see ourselves and, and where we need to, to strengthen ourselves. And that's, that's really a critical, critical opening to growth, being able to, to feel that it, I, you know, I'm a good person, but I'm not perfect, and I, it's uh, it's okay for me to to digest my imperfections and then work on them. But if I, I'm not going to work on them unless I first digest them, 
So the idea of, here it's a soir, which is this leavening agent, symbolizes this puffiness of the ego. Now, puffiness of the ego, it's also a, 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 you know, a, a difficult balance. We, we should have a sense of self and we should have a sense of courage. I mean, it, it, for people in the Ukraine to say, who are we to be able to, to, to fight Russia and you know, let's, let's just surrender and, and act in what we may call a humble way? Who says there's any holiness in that? The idea of, of standing up for the right thing and that's with a sense of self. That's a good thing. That's holy. Doing that in a um, going be, beyond our, a, a healthy self perception to what we would call more of a, a shallow arrogance. That's not healthy. But there's, there's, it, there isn't holiness if I if I am uh, um, a, a very proficient in math. There's no holiness in me saying, "Well, really, I don't I don't know too much math." That's that's not true. It's a lie. There's no holiness there. It's for me to, to say, yes, I do. Do you need any help? Something I can help you with. Um, but not to think that necessarily we're Albert Einstein. I don't, you know, each, each one had, needs to have a, 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 an accurate self-perception and also to recognize that we, we, we were fortunate in, in, in uh, perhaps in our schooling and in our natural skill set, not to get, uh, you know, become a legend in our own mind, but to, to recognize our, our own, our, our own um, skills and talents that we bring to the world and, and, and um, acknowledge them to ourselves or to others if that's necessary. So the idea of self is, is that's fine, it's holy. The, the idea of, and it, it, so it gets a, a problematic when we move out of that, then it goes too far with that. And here, when it comes to the, to the altar, the altar was a place, the, the, the tabernacle is a place where there, there was a, a more intense sense of surrender because of God. So even, even a person who has, I used an example of someone who has a math proficiency, they're not denying it there, but it's just, I'm, I'm talking to the infinite. I'm connecting with the infinite. It's, 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 it, 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 there's nothing else. And therefore, even what is normally more a healthy, a healthy sense of self and, and one's skill set, it really didn't have much of a place there because it was losing oneself in connection with the divine. It's not that it was bad, it just had no place there. Now, when it comes to honey or these sweet fruits, because again, the Torah uses the, 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 the word honey. So, I guess the best way for us to get our minds around the mystical angle on this, the uh, insight into what this is, is that uh, I was thinking about this morning, the best way to, um, uh, best way to, to approach this. So let's uh, try it this way. You notice I, uh, I, what I put down before, I had written in case we were going to talk about it, I had written this. You see at the bottom here. So this is a Hebrew word, chesed. It means kindness. This is another word, gavura, which can mean strength. It could also mean strictness. So these are two very primary uh, energies within God and within us. Right hand, left hand, uh, right, right side, the left side, it's, they're very, um, they're, they're common, uh, um, common, these are commonly referenced in, in, in mystical writings and understanding that, they're, that they're, there's a flow in life and chesed is when I'm giving. So it's kindness to a pauper, but it could be someone when I, I finish the class and I see someone in the hall and I say, and I and I I embrace them either physically or emotionally with friendliness. That's chesed. It's connection. Gvura, at its core, would mean that I 
I don't that I I I leave space. So even if, here's a person who, oh wow, I, I, I'm embracing them. Say, how have you been? I haven't seen you in so many years, but I, there's some things I shouldn't ask. There's some there's it's, even if I want to totally embrace the person, there are limits to that. There's you know depending on who the person is, you have to give them their space. You have to respect their privacy. And that's a gavura thing. So gavura is really having the inner strength to discipline ourselves and to to um, to be able to 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 step out of ourselves and step out of a, a an emotional rhythm we're in. So if here I'm I'm so happy to see the person I know I'm talking, I, I still have to maintain a balance that. I'm not going to overwhelm them, and I'm not going to stand there. They were on their way somewhere. Who, how much time do they have? And also, my questions, I mean, we all know what it means to give space. So, Gvura, you know, the, the Torah, the, the Talmud tells us, asks us, who is a Gibur, a valiant one, and which is the same word as Gvura. It's, it's, it's a, a valiant one is, is the, the, the person, but the Gvura is what they exercise, what they, what they, uh, what they evince. That they manifest. So it says, who is a valiant one? A person who is able to conquer their own instincts. So it's inner discipline and it's conquering instincts. Now, sometimes that comes to strictness. Now, what does that mean? Because if we assume that the per a person always uh, you know they, they are, are again not, not all of us are like this but there is this uh, default position of wanting to connect with others and uh, relationships are the stuff of life being able to stand back is respectful but that can become aloofness similarly when if, if we're giving if i'm if uh, i'm with my, my my grandchildren and i, I want to I want to give them things. I want them to be happy. I want them to, uh, to be happy with, uh, the, you know, that uh, Zaydi was good to them. So if they're in here, you know, I've, I've got uh, seltzer mixed nuts to give to them. If they're in my house, I have, I have some junk I can give them. But should I? So I have to temper, you know, I want to be sure I want to give them cookies. But is that good for them? I have to speak to their parents first. So I have to withhold my giving. Now, there's healthy withholding. And then there's oh, too much. I'm not giving anything because I don't want to spoil them. So that in the, in the, how things evolve both within us and within the, 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 the um, spiritual cosmos within the metaphysical cosmos the idea of guvura at its core within the divine is god leaving space for us which is a good thing our god limiting the the untrammeled flow of of infinite divinity so that God can channel something that, that's, that's approachable to us. If God just lets it rip with all infinity, we're going to disappear. We're not, we're not, it's, we're totally overwhelmed. We want blessings within, uh, the, the, within our, uh, our system, something that's not going to override our system, that we can appreciate, that we can, uh, that we can feel that too much is, is not good either. So the, Chesed is, is in, in the case of God, it's giving. And that's the, the rhythm of Chesed, it's God giving, letting it all flow. But letting it all flow means there's no space for us. It's infinity overtakes the world. The infinite oneness overtakes the world. There's all oneness, so there's no, where's there space for us? So God limits. Something we call tzimtzum, God constricting and, and uh, uh, God's presence. So in the mystical writings, uh, Kabbalistic writings, say that God is, you know, before creation of the world, or all of existence 
if there was such a thing that we can call existence is all godliness. Godliness is the source of, of goodness, of, 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 of genuine tranquility, pleasure, whatever human words we attach to it. One of the words we attach to it is sweetness because um, uh, splendor is sweet, sugar is sweet, and then there's also, there, there are, like a, a child's smile is sweet. A touch can be sweet. A, 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 a tune can be sweet. There's sweetness that's not so tangibly anchored in the physical. It's sweetness, the concept that all comes from God. God is the 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 the, the, uh, the source of sweetness, but God again is untrammeled. So God, so God, a symbol of God limiting that sweetness and making it approachable to us. In the words of uh, the great Kabbalists, is honey. Doesn't mean honey. Means something intensely sweet that we can taste. That's a. It, it's it's really the language is that's an example of God's gavura, God's withholding the untrammeled sweetness and and creating something for us very very tangible and very much within our taste buds within our human system that we can digest and we can appreciate that's the honey so that's all a good thing and when we take dip an apple into honey on rosh hashanah what are we saying that the apple is one thing but there's the honey part and because we dip challah into honey also it's there's the honey is is on the table rosh hashanah and we keep it on the table through uh, up till Sukkot in, in Chabad circles. The idea of honey is that we want to have a tangible, appreciable sweetness. It's we, God blesses me. I, I believe that God loves me. That's great. But that can be at some metaphysical level. That actually somehow God is is fueling my soul and, is, uh, that, and blessing. But you know, I, I like to see it practical i'd like to see it in my life if i you know if uh, in, in what i need to be able to taste to taste god's sweetness not just to have it in my mind's eye and, and, and faith and in blessing ourselves for a new year we we want ta tangible sweetness and that's all good there's no downside to it one of the things is that in the temple similar to the way we said in coming into the to the tabernacle in connection with God, and saying, "My, I have my skill set, and God gave me the skill set, and I worked for it, and I all, all those things, and I should not be saying, oh, I don't have it." When I'm in, in coming connection with God, it, it's not it's not a relevant part. It's it's I'm, I'm connecting with God, me and my essence beyond the skill set, and looking to, to God in God's essence. I'm 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 embracing um, uh, my my loving parent, creator, divine spouse, however we're going to frame it. What uh, mystics say is even our, our appreciation at that point for, for the human honey is not something that we should, that should be on the altar. That should not be working its way in to the equation of the embrace of God. God is the honey. God, the sweetness is, is in being able to have God in my life. Do I want to experience in, in, in human blessing? Of course I want to. And that's maybe why I walked in to begin with, because I want a connection with God, because I want to feel God's blessing in my life. And if I feel God's blessing in my life, then ultimately I don't I want to feel it at, at a very tangible level. And there's, there's nothing wrong with me wanting that. But when I'm in that, at the pinnacle of connection, and I'm something. I'm bringing something to the altar. Honey is not part of the equation. It's not what I'm going to get out of you. If, if you when you're when two people 
really care about each other and they're looking at each other and they're talking about the relationship and they're looking into each other's eyes, it's not, it should not be the thought of, because, you know, I, 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 I'm going to need you to make me a cool. I'm going to need you to, to, you know, to take care of me whatever, when I, I get old, whatever. It's, there's a connection. And our, our personal honey, that is sweetness that we've been drawing from it, it's a great thing, but that's not the, the connection. The connection is beyond that. Uh, this person is, is great because uh, she makes me a kugel. It's, this person matters to me because she matters to me. And uh, as an outgrowth of that, it is a reciprocal, so no, 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 she'll make me a cool. But it's not, it's not about uh, the honey really doesn't have a place there at, at, at the, the juncture of connection. So from that perspective, see that whenever we, we, we bring this offering to God in, in verse 11, we say, there's no leavening agents or any sweet fruits. So again, it's, it's, I, I'm using honey because the Torah uses the language of honey, but honey is a broad term in Torah to also include anything of intense sweetness. Um, I will leave it over here. Let's get it with you. Um, are there any questions? Deal with that. If not, we can uh, all pray for peace throughout the world, especially in the Ukraine. They, they, they need a lot of stuff and uh, they need our prayers. Rabbi? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the donations through um, Chabad, where do they, where, where are they directed to in the Ukraine? Um, it depends. I mean, I, I, we can send to uh, Kiev, they definitely need. Right now, it what really, are, where are you sending um, money? Um, I, I'm actually sending now to Lvov because from there, they're sending out, it's, it's very hard to get anything into Kiev right now. Right. So we're sending to Lvov, I'm sending to people I know. I know are you sending people. dollars or, or actual? Uh, right, now we're sending goods, we're also sending dollars, yeah. We're sending dollars and, and they could use it. And the, the people I know, that they're, they're directing it. Right now, the hotspots, there are like four hotspots. The, the big hotspots are Kiev and Kharkov and uh, Yelichikas uh, and, uh, and uh, Mariupol are two difficult places, but the real heat is not in those two smaller places. The real heat is in, in Kharkov and, uh, and Kiev. And but there's a lot of, I mean, it, this is going on all over the place and there's a lot of pain elsewhere too. So, you know, the people on the ground will know best where to direct it. Lvov seems to now be more accessible to get things there and for them to be able to spread it out. So I'm sending it there now. It, it may change. I'm in touch with people in the Nepetrovsk also, they call it the Nepro now, um, which right now is somewhat safe, but it's not, it's, they're very worried, but uh, at least I can get things there. Are you can. sending it to someone you personally know? Yeah. You mean the rabbi there? Yeah, he's the shrubby. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have a great week. Share good news.